Thank you very much. Uh, I, I'm sorry to, to de delay my speech, but uh, until I lubricate myself, uh, I won't be any use at all. My doctor said drink eight glasses. I'm down to four, but uh, I'm not going to drink any more, that, otherwise I'll have to move into the washroom. What between drinking water and different glasses, uh, it's the bane of my life. Over 80 years ago in 1928, at the age of five, my granddad took me to my first Remembrance Sunday service in the town of my birth, Barnsley. The air that day was thick with grief and tobacco smoke from all those who had come to pay respects to their sons, husbands, uncles and fathers who had taken the king's shilling and fallen in the Great War, which had only ended ten years previous. On that long ago Sunday, I don't remember when the people wore puppies or not, because the grief from that war was as fresh and as lonely as newly dug graves in a churchyard cemetery. Back then, the need for symbols to remember the dead in war wasn't seen as it is now, as a means to prod collective memory of our citizens, without whose experiences today of total war are limited to either endless bouts of call of duty on their Xbox, or as viewers of television nostalgia that portrays early 20th century Britain as steadfast, patriotic and stoic in the face of so much death. We understand so little now about the hardships and heartache of our ancestors because too much time separates us from the trenches of France, the Blitz, the numbing cold of the Korean Peninsula, or every other battlefield that British forces have served on since the armistice of 1918. But I am old, so I remember the grief from that long ago time when my family and my community went to the cenotaph to remember our dead. I recall how the hurt from the loss of a loved one was etched on people's faces like it had been cut with jagged glass. Even my granddad had sacrificed a son to that seamless war, senseless war. Like many others, he, ceased, he eased his sorrow over the death of one of his boys through a faith that could, that said that lives of the dead had been spent defending an imperfect democracy. But there were a great many others, like my mum, who believed that their loved ones lived lives had been squandered by an uncaring elite whose only concern was the preservation of their privileges, profits and position in an unjust society. Yet no matter how much people debated the cause of them or the merits of the Great War, everyone believed the price in lost lives to our country was too great and so the credo never again was coined. But the message did not live past September 1939, when the Second World War began. I was a veteran of that war and served the RAF from our country's darkest to finest hour, and have never regretted doing my very small part in keeping our country safe. However, Despite my acknowledgments that World War II was a just war, that Britain fought with bravery, I am not sure I can say the same 
for our battles during the Cold War or the annual wars Britain has fought every year since 1945 to maintain her colonies, preserve dictators, shore up alliances and expand commerce or diminish our civil liberties through a nefarious war on terror. It is for those reasons last year that I decided to stop wearing the poppy because I find this message is no longer about remembrance, sacrifice, loss, and putting an end to conflict. Instead, it has become an endless drumbeat that pounds out one message that war is always inevitable and always noble. So I shall never again wear symbols that are tainted by party politics when I pay observance to the dead this year. Instead, I will be unadorned and wear my 91 years of experience in war and peace with pride. I have earned the right by service to my country to not wear the poppy and to demand an earnest debate as to why this country is more proficient in killing than in preserving life. But I am also grateful to all who have served and will serve in the armed forces for their task is not safe, easy or ennobling. However, it is time that we remember that if the state is intent to send our children's children off to war, it is their duty not private charities, nor the public, to see that they are properly cared for when the tunes of glory become a distant echo. Thank you.